um, some of your ancestors actually uh, owned and sold slaves to the Europeans. It, it was a normal thing for a king to hold slaves in, in, in those days. Forgi for forgive me, I think, forgive me, I think sorry, forgive me, story. Yemi. I think you are reading too much history. You are, you are trying to tell me the history That's the of point. where I'm a historian. Came. Welcome back to Rattlesnake TV, guys. In this video, we are going to be watching our boy, Rafe Hadel Manku, debating slave reparations. Now, this one is very informative and interesting, but the way it ends is nothing short of jaw dropping. You really could not even write this script. So with that, Let's get into the first part. Are you satisfied with a billion? Should it be more? I think you always start from somewhere. But what I'm saying is it, it could be an investment that more money could be put in the pot for future. So we can't put real money value on the dangers, uh, on, on, the, on the bad, on the effect this has on people over the years, and even for us who are still living now, but we can change the future. That's why the investment of this to re-educate and to help the downstream will help a lot for the future. Uh, Reverend Dr. Ian Paul, no amount of money can make up for the historical sins of the Church of England. Uh, no, that's a really interesting question. And the, the, one of the issues is, uh, are we in the business of atoning the sins for previous generations? Uh, I'm half Irish. My mother came over from Dublin after the war and she faced signs saying no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. And of course, the Irish were treated terribly by British colonialism. Millions died in the potato famine uh, and, and many, many Irish were enslaved as well. So if we're going to rep do reparations for uh, other parts of slavery, should we do it for this? I think the real problem is this report, which isn't really a, a Church of England report, it's come from a group referring to another group, and there's no, been no sort of real scrutiny of this. The problem is it makes a claim that we are sitting directly on money that was made from the slave trade. And unfortunately, the historical data says that's not true. At the time when the Queen Anne's bounty was invested in the South Sea Company, the South Sea Company actually lost money in their slave trading. Uh, that's not to say that it's not abhorrent. It's not to say that the, that the Church of England at the time failed to challenge this, this wicked trade, but they actually got the money from government bonds. But there's a, a two other bits of, of information we need to take really seriously. One is, um, is there a direct connection between inequality between different ethnic groups today and the past of slavery? I think that's very, very hard to argue, given that from government data, those who do best, for instance, in the education system, number one are Chinese, number two are Asian, number three are black Africans. And at the bottom of that list comes black Caribbeans and white working class British. So uh, we, we need to take seriously what the data okay. says about inequality. A, a I think the third thing is, are we, are we concerned about combating inequality? And the answer is, we certainly are. We certainly are interested in pursuing justice. Oh. And I've got no objection to that uh, at all. A lot, of different, a lot of different points raised there in that answer from Ian. Rafe, just take the historical point, first of all, that the, the whole thing was based on flawed research. That's right. I mean, it says directly in the um, in the report that slavery was uh, was the, the the issue was the industry that actually fueled Britain's growth in the 17th and 18th centuries, and that's patently absurd. I mean, in 1770, slavery accounted for. I mean, the sugar industry, which was based on slavery, accounted for three percent of uh, capital formation in Britain. That's a sum equivalent to what was being spent on a uh, beer, hops. And barley. And nobody has ever suggested that the beer industry fueled uh, Britain's economic growth during that period. In fact, of course, Britain has more than paid its debts in terms of slavery by becoming the first nation in history to spend money against its own national interest. I'm speaking about the vast resources that were spent with the West Africa Squadron in enforcing an end to the Atlantic slave trade. The amount of money spent was about 2% of GDP. That's a sum equivalent to our entire defense budget today. And that's also not including the vast amount spent later in actually freeing slaves, a debt that Britain only paid uh, recently. Uh, there's been, never been a case in history where one nation did so much to try to atone yep. for its sin. 
the, okay. the, the second half of the British Empire was all about atoning, and it's thanks to the Church of England who actually uh, created the atmosphere for abolitionism that uh, we, we have the abolition of the slave trade. Were it not for the Church of England, abolition may not have happened for decades later. So the C of E should be celebrating its role in abolishing slavery rather than constantly wearing a horsehair shirt and beating us right. up about it. Right. So the Church of England actually did play a significant role in the abolition of slavery. There were abolitionists at the time, who by the way guys were white men, such as William Wilberforce and Henry Thornton, who pushed the idea that the reason Britain had to not only end slavery on its own shores, but also around the world, was because they're a Christian empire. And of course, slavery and the subjugation of your fellow human being is a morally abhorrent practice. Financially, in some ways, it was actually very burdensome for Britain to do so. And this is a crazy fact, but according to the Tax Justice Network, it was only in 2015, according to the Treasury, that British taxpayers finished paying off the debt which British government incurred in order to compensate British slave owners in 1835 because of the abolition of slavery. And now this is not to say that the British colonies, as well as in part slavery, were not very profitable for the empire during times of mercantilism. Mercantilism was based on the principle that the world's wealth was static and consequently the governments had to regulate trade to build their wealth and national power. Many European nations attempted to accumulate the largest possible share of that wealth by maximizing their exports and limiting their imports via tariffs. And for a while there, this was actually very profitable. The British would take supplies from their colonies such as sugar, fruit, coffee from the Caribbean, and lumber, tobacco, and rice from America, and then export them. However, I am firmly of the belief that the economic impact that Europeans had on Africa was far greater than the economic impact that Africa had on European empires. British infrastructure such as railroads and schools, as well as medicines and also commercial products were responsible for transforming these African economies. And I would say brought them up to speed with the modern world in as much as they are up to speed with the modern world. I mean, Thomas Sowell covers this in his work, but the European impact on colonial Africa is basically responsible for the entire industrial and commercial sector in those countries. They also introduced new crops and farming techniques, etc. But anyways, let's get on to the next part. Right, Jamie, I'd, I'd like to get your answer on that because the other two are saying that essentially it, it's a it's flawed history. And in any case, they've the, the England, the Church of England and the rest of the other institutions have paid their debt. I think I think we have to put an woman um, Human um, aspect into this. It's not only about whether the some some parts of money have been paid. We are talking about the humanization of human beings that have led to generations that have lost their identity, that um, have uh, led to racism, and that I, as a person, I'm, I'm, I'm still suffering part of that that came out of that. And then my, so are my parents and the children that are born in this country. So it's not even, that's why I, I, I keep saying, you cannot put money value, uh, what you pay back for slavery. Yes, slavery was abolished, but in reality, some of us are still enslaved today into the world of racism that we can never get out of. Now, I am black. I understand what I'm talking about. That might be very different to someone who is not from the context and the, uh, the, the, the background where I come from. But ask, stop any person of uh, black heritage, either Caribbean or African, and ask them the same question they will tell you that it cuts deep into their being, into their soul, that they see from generation up, could, up could to where they are. Can I just let Rafe are, come in there for a second? Generation behind. Could, could I let Rafe come in? Yeah, I think it's deeply patronizing and offensive to treat any group of people as victims when they clearly aren't. We're talking about the great, 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 great grandchildren of slavery. And as appalling and horrendous as slavery was, and of course that's undeniable, What's also undeniable, and this is an uncomfortable truth, is that the lives of the descendants of slaves alive today in Britain are of a far higher quality and far better than if their ancestors had never, never left West Africa. In Benin and Nigeria, for example, which is where most slaves came from, the average life expectancy is 60. In Britain, for a black person, it's 85. The uh, quarter of a century longer, essentially. If you look at uh, disposable income, the average income in Benin is 1,300 per, per year. In Nigeria, it's 2,000. In Britain, it's 35,000 pounds, just over 20 times higher. So as horrendous as slavery was, 
it's impossible for me to understand in precisely what way it has disadvantaged black people today. What's disadvantaging them is constantly telling them that they are victims and that their own situation is a result of other people rather than actually situations within their own communities. Ian, before I bring Femi back in, can I just- Guys, just before we get into the next part, make sure to smash that like button as hard as you possibly can. And also, if you like this content, if you enjoy these discussions, subscribe to the channel because there's plenty more from where this came from. Back to it. Yeah, yeah, I, think, I think there's some really, some really strange things going on here. I mean, the idea that I am wounded by the treatment of my great-great-grandfather, I mean, that means I must carry the burden of, for instance, the potato famine. So why aren't I being compensated? But I think that the problem with this whole debate is that if you read the report and you read other statements that are coming out from some groups in the Church of England, it's being cast very much in the terms of what's known as critical race theory, imported from America, which is part of the culture wars. And the problem there is that how I feel feel about myself dominates and, and, and there's no rational answer to that. If I feel disadvantaged, then I am disadvantaged and I need to be compensated. And the report is full of the language of deconstructing whiteness. Now, I think that's racist language. So this report and this whole approach is actually a racist approach to anti-racism. And I think it's just, we can see from the conflict that this has had and the strong reactions on either side, this is no way at all in order to address some important issues about history okay, and let's justice. Bring, let's bring Yemi back in. I think my, my, my challenge here is that uh, if you, any of you, have ever experienced discrimination, prejudice, um, res, um, I have. My mother has. Racism, my grandfather in, in has. My own, grandfather in, in took up arms against let, let the British explain, oppressor. Let me explain. Right. The way, you, the way you experience it as a white person is different from a person of color like myself. And I will I'm say that because- too. Why is that? Why, why are I'm, we dividing I'm, let me, ourselves let me by explain, race? Let me, let me explain. What I'm, what I'm trying to say to you is that uh, all these are outcome of slavery. Because there are some things that have uh, become parts and parcel of the way you are wired as a human being. That even when you are part in diaspora, in this part of the world, there's no way you are not going to experience that. And these are the outcome of slavery that you might, you have not experienced, you don't understand what it takes. And I'm saying that because these are intergenerational uh, repercussions of what slavery has caused. Where people for me, this isn't ancient history, for me, my grandfather, who I knew, took up arms against a racist colonial are, oppressor. Right? So, so why, even why is it not affecting me the same way? Because we find ourselves in the part of the world where I, I would not expect the, uh, the experience of slavery will not be a great effect for me if I live in Nigeria. But it will be different for the black Americans and those living in Caribbean because of those experiences. And it's different for me but because I live in America. diaspora here in the West. You're so talking about the Church of England in there's Britain here. There's understanding that we need to take note of. It's not, it's not about economics, whether the GDP, whether the, the, the where, where people live longer in the UK than they live longer in Africa, but we are talking about the the effect of dehumanization that still affects people till today. And that's why we're doesn't. saying that... Yemi, <laughs> Yemi if, I could just, if I could just interrupt you for one second, let's pick up on that point, please, uh, Rafe. It is an important point, which has been raised uh, many times. Uh, they say that it was worse than just slavery. They were actually dehumanized and that it continues today. It doesn't continue today. I mean, there is no evidence backing it up. The most disadvantaged group in Britain are actually white working class boys. Only 4% of the British population is actually black. So to, to, do, to give £1 billion, an astonishing amount of money for such a small group when there are so many other equally deserving people of all colours, of all creeds uh, and of all races, well, is, is, it is and always will be wrong. And it seems increasingly that the Church of England is motivated not so much by doing the most good, but by virtue signalling to the current fashions. What uh, it's doing is it's gradually replacing theology with ideology, and it's the ideology of critical race theory, and it's, you know, it's offspring, DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And it's importing, you know, essentially into this country, the culture wars of America. And there's a new religion it's instituting. It's the religion of woke with new original sin, and the new original sin is slavery. So this sounds like a very harsh thing to say, but when you think about it, the descendants of slaves who live in Western countries today are much better off than their relatives 
who are not the descendants of slaves who still live in Africa. And I mean, this is obviously dependent on your values, but what would you rather? Would you rather be born in Britain as the descendant of a slave, or would you rather be born in Cameroon as the descendant of a free man? I know what I'd rather. And I mean, this is probably why we don't see droves of descendants of slaves fleeing Britain to return to the motherland of Africa. That's not a very popular trend. And this is not to say that race relations are perfect and that they don't have a historical grievance because they do. But the simple fact is that no matter what color your skin, if you are born in Australia, America, Britain, or one of these wealthy Western nations, you are, in a global sense, privileged. Moreover, everybody has a family tree, guys. And if you run your finger down people's family trees, it'll probably only take maximum a few generations to find some sort of gross oppression. You're sure to find somebody who was the victim of some sort of historical atrocity. I mean, my great grandparents on my mother's side were forced to flee Yugoslavia. They had to take their two infant sons and leave or else they would be killed by the communists. I mean, all of the land that had been in the family for generations was taken, friends were killed, etc. And then eventually they somehow made it to Australia on a boat. They arrived with absolutely nothing and they were forced to try and make a life. And that's what they did. They didn't have time to sit around and act like victims. They had to build and survive. And this is is basically the story of history. He's correct in saying that Africans and Caribbean people were subjugated and were dehumanized. It's a terrible thing. History is very ugly. But the fact of the matter is that these particular parts of history are constantly highlighted and are constantly brought to the forefront. These are seen as the epitome of victimhood when really the 20th century was literally filled with bloodshed. There are so many cultures throughout just the last hundred years that you could point to and say, these guys are the barometer of victimhood. And it's far more recent than slavery. Why don't we? Because the people who are pushing these narratives hate Western civilization. And so with that guys, let's get into the last exchange now, which is one of the most outrageous moments of hypocrisy I have ever seen. Uh, Rafe, uh, essentially then, the report is asking the Church of England to apologize for spreading Christianity, its own mission, uh, in Africa. Well, the first thing to note is that this report isn't written by a group of impartial authorities. That, and that must be said. In fact, one, one of the members of, the, of this oversight group is a self-proclaimed activist, reparationist, a member of the International Campaign for Reparation. So this isn't a group of, of, uh, of academics who are neutral. And yes, the, the point's very important. What we should be saying is that the Church of England, for the first time in human history, we had the evangelical Christian movement called the Clapham sect, just a mile or so from me here in London, that created slavery was universal, but the rise of the abolitionist movement was unique to world history. And it was something that could only ever have come out of Britain and Protestant Western Europe. And we should be celebrating that and look forward rather right. than permanently creating a system of victimhood in this country. I just want to give the last answer here to, to, um, to Yemi. Because Yemi, you have a very interesting background, you know, descended from African nobility. Um, some of your ancestors actually uh, owned and sold slaves to the Europeans. Now, that's a very complex picture, isn't it? Because there, there will be um, black people whose ancestors did do the same thing. Should they receive uh, funds as well? I don't think so, because um, the, the whole issue of uh, slavery, compensation, and what, what not, is not something we pay emphasis to uh, back where I come from in West Africa. Uh, is, is long gone, is forgotten. Uh, there are other forms of evil that are existing there today. Uh, but it, it was a normal thing for a king to hold slaves in, in, in those days. My great-great-great-grandparents are a king in one of the tribes in Nigeria. Uh, have slaves, hold slaves. Mm -hmm. But the truth is they do not dehumanize their slaves because they work for them. Um, well, forgive, forgive, think, forgive me, I think, forgive me. I think sorry, forgive me, Yemi. Uh, forgive me, Yemi. No, do, do come in. If, if the issue's been forgotten in Nigeria, why on earth are we banging on about it here now with reparations? If, if in Nigeria they've forgotten about this, there are more important things to deal with. Surely in the Church of England there are more important injustices to deal with than what happened 250 years ago, which we repented of. But I, I just want to highlight the point that Yemi's making. He's saying that in those times in Africa, amongst kings, it was normal to own slaves and to sell slaves. And, but what they didn't do is take the additional step of dehumanizing them. Um, yeah, come in, Rafe. 
Yeah, I'm a, yeah, I mean, the, the, there were more slaves held in bondage in Africa than were ever transported across the continent, across the transatlantic slave trade. And actually, if you look at places like Benin and the Kingdom of Dahomey, they had absolutely brutal treatment of slaves. In fact, you know, they were also working on plantations there too. Not only that, every year there were annual human sacrifices of slaves uh, in the numbers of tens of thousands, amounting eventually to hundreds of thousands, if not millions. So the idea that they were living in some sort of unchattel type of slavery is for the birds, I'm afraid. Yemi, um, it's, I think, it's, I think, it's... I think, I think you are reading too much history. You are, you are trying to tell me the history the of point. where... I'm a historian. I'm telling you the fact. I, I care. I care. <laughs> this is my origin. You want to interpret and educate me on my origin? I think that, that that's appalling. This is but this, this is, the, is where, this is the thing we're contending now. You see, this because is this report world. is not based go, on historical go to, fact. Go to Ghana. It's making historical claims, but they're not go to, based on historical go to, Badagri, go to all these places. These are the these these are the places are still there. The history are there. I I beg of you to go there and go and read the history and and, and meet the. I wish the you would too, of because the, facts are more important than feelings. And let them explain This is the problem with the entire Black Lives Matter movement and the reparations. Absolutely not true. My great grandparents, which they still have the place where they keep the slaves, how they treat them, how they how they feed them, what, what they do for them. They send them on errands. In fact, some of them go away from being slaves to go back to where they come from and then become ships in their own village. So what you are trying to say is absolutely, how can you know my history more than me? Unbelievable. So it's okay when his descendants hold slaves, but when white people do it, oh no, that's bad. And now you need to cough up a billion dollars, whitey. You see, when we Africans hold slaves, it's chill because they're just working for us. Plus that was then, it was normal to do it back then. And now we have modern day problems that are more important that we have to worry about. Plus we were cool to our slaves. We didn't even dehumanize them. Really? Guys, what we just saw there was the perfect microcosm of the woke historical discourse that we see in our current culture. White Christian Europeans are seen as evil demonic creatures who have just plundered the entire world and everyone else victim. This despite the fact that every culture did bad things and there is actually a very strong case to be made that the Christian empires were the most moral out of all of them, hence the abolitionist movement. So with that guys, check me out below Twitter, Instagram, Jake Rattle SNK. Reach out to me if you'd like to. Also, if you'd like to subscribe to the channel, if you haven't done so already, right here. And if you'd like to watch another video, right here. Till next time, I'm Jake. This is Rattlesnake TV, keeping you armed and dangerous.